Historian David Hackett Fisher tells us of an inscription found in a tattered book in Moore County, North Carolina, dating to well before the Civil War. David Kennedy, his book he may read good, but God knows when. How good did they read in the colonial and antebellum periods? Here are five things about Northern and Southern literacy, some of which may surprise you. Number one, some historians have been fooled into thinking literacy rates were uniformly low in the Southern backcountry, but in fact they varied widely by place, wealth, rank, and ethnicity. More than 90% of German Protestant and French Huguenot settlers could write their names. Meanwhile, 50% of Scottish Highlanders who made their wills in Cumberland County, North Carolina during the late 18th century had to sign by Mark. Fisher writes, between these broad extremes were immigrants from the north of England, the lowlands of Scotland, and Northern Ireland, of whom approximately 20 to 30 percent signed by Mark in the mid-18th century, a level which was very near the average for the region as a whole. This pattern of backcountry literacy was similar to that in the borderlands of North Britain in both its central tendency and its variations. Variations by social rank were very great in the borderlands. Nearly all the gentry were literate as early as the 17th century, but less than 15% of laborers could write their names in the lowlands of Scotland and in the north of England as late as 1770. These differences also were carried to America. Number two, by contrast, the Puritans who settled New England made their colonies more literate than any part of British America, and the part of England they came from, East Anglia, had higher literacy rates than any other part of rural England. A 1647 Massachusetts statute was dubbed the Old Deluder Law after its preamble, which asserted that it was one chief project of that old deluder Satan to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures. Fisher writes that the old deluder law compelled every town of 50 families to hire a schoolmaster and every town of 100 families to keep a grammar school which offered instruction in Latin and Greek, the masters thereof being able to instruct youth so far as they may be fitted for the university. This statute did not demand compulsory school attendance, but it did require compulsory maintenance of public schools, as the Puritans began to call them in the 17th century. As a result, children in Massachusetts received more than twice as many years of schooling as did youngsters in Virginia. Number three, despite the efforts of reformers, the South neglected education well into the antebellum and even postbellum periods. An education committee of the Louisiana legislature reported in 1831 that less than one third of the state's white children received any instruction at all. In 1859, the Alabama Superintendent of Education reported that nearly half the state's children were attending any school. Georgia didn't get around to establishing free public schools until 1877. Historian Clement Eaton wrote, The aristocratic attitude inherited from England that it was not necessary to educate the masses changed slowly in sections of the older South like Virginia and South Carolina. Certainly the isolation characteristic of Southern life with its scattered homes and indescribably bad roads did much to hinder the diffusion of education. Fully as important as these factors was the reluctance of the people to tax themselves. Governor Swain in his message to the legislature of North Carolina in 1835 said that the legislature was in the habit of imposing taxes on the people amounting to less than $100,000 annually. Of this sum, half was spent in rewarding legislatures for their services, while the remainder was employed in paying the administrative officers of the state government. It required a long period of agitation before the people of the southern states, as well as their northern neighbors, would tax themselves for education. Furthermore, many destitute farmers were deterred from sending their children to such schools as were provided because of their repugnance to make the required declaration of poverty. Number four, according to Fisher, the back country was an oral culture in which writing was less important than the spoken word. The back settlers maintained an attitude of cultivated contempt for orthography. The future president, Andrew Jackson, once declared that he could never respect a man who knew only one way to spell a word. He was not entirely joking. This attitude was widely shared in the backcountry as it had been in the British borderlands where it was observed that the spelling even of well-educated people was highly variable for a much longer period than in other regions. This culture was impoverished in its written literature, but it was rich in ballads and folk tales which were carefully handed down from one generation to the next. 
An oral culture placed an exceptionally high value on speaking the truth. The penalty for lying or breaking one's word of honor was ostracism from the society and even from one's kin. This oral culture also put a high value on memory, which was often strong in proportion to the weakness of the written word. A case in point was George Matthews, a backcountry governor of Georgia, who was barely able to read and write. He was unlearned, an acquaintance recalled. He spelt coffee K-A-U-G-H-P-H-Y. He wrote Congress with a K. When governor, he dictated messages to his secretary and then sent them to the Irish schoolmaster to put them into grammar. At the same time, Governor Matthews was a highly intelligent man capable of heroic feats of memory. His memory was unequaled. Whilst he was a member of Congress, an important document which had been read during the session was lost. He was able to repeat its contents verbatim. As Sheriff of Augusta County before the Revolution, Matthews kept the county tax list in his head and recollected for a long time the name of every taxpayer. Number five. As we discussed in a recent episode on antebellum cousin marriage, cultural evolution scholar Joseph Henrich has written about the psychological peculiarity of weird societies. Weird being Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. He writes that the spread of the Protestant religion, of which Puritanism was an important branch, and its emphasis on individuals' ability to read the Bible for themselves, helped to create weird populations whose brains were wired differently from those of most of the world throughout human history. According to Henrik, broad-based literacy changed people's brains and altered their cognitive abilities in domains related to memory, visual processing, facial recognition, numerical exactness, and problem solving. It probably also indirectly altered family sizes, child health, and cognitive development as mothers became increasingly literate and formally educated. These psychological and social changes may have fostered speedier innovations, new institutions, and, in the long run, greater economic prosperity. Regarding New England, Henrik observes that, even before formal schools opened, Puritan parents looked for ways to teach their children to read, write, and do arithmetic. Protestants also believed that girls needed schooling, which led to more educated and literate mothers. Maternal literacy has especially large effects on child health and cognitive development. Although literacy rates were much lower in the South, especially the backcountry, than in the North, Fisher explains that, by comparison with other parts of the world, the backcountry was not illiterate. At a time when 20 to 30 percent of males in the Southern Highlands were unable to read and write, the proportion of illiteracy in Italy and Spain was 70 to 80 percent. Still, Eaton wrote that by the time of the 1850 census, the southern states had an illiteracy ratio among the native white population over 20 years of age of 20.3 percent, the middle states 3 percent, and New England 0.42 percent. Superintendent DeBow pointed out that so excellent was the New England school system that only one person over 20 years of age in 400 of the native white population could not read and write, as compared with one in 12 for the slaveholding states and one in 40 for the free states as a whole. I suspect that much of the cultural tensions between North and South stem from the fact that while both societies were weird compared to most of the rest of the world, the North was getting weirder at a much faster rate than the South. We'll keep exploring further implications of the weird divide in future episodes. Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss them. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.